that cross. Well, we have uh, some guests with us tonight. We appreciate missionaries. This is the Canode family. I didn't know they were coming, but they have been at Brother Giddens, and he told them to come by here, and we appreciate them coming by. And uh, their uh, ministry is directly uh, at my heart because my dad was a 28-year uh, veteran, he retired 28 years in the service, and died lost. And uh, so I, I really appreciate folks who are willing to go to our military and uh, try to reach them. And uh, this Brother Canode, we'll get him to come and give us his burden for just a few minutes. And, and, uh, and he, you can introduce your family when you come, Brother, if you'll come on. Hi, my name is Philip Canode. Uh, I'm a missionary with Armed Forces Baptist Mission. Uh, I'm, I'm starting a military serviceman center at Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska uh, in order to be able to reach our uh, a door in to be able to reach our military at that base. And um, the, verse, the verse that we've chosen for our, for our ministry is in, in Jude chapter 1 and verse 22. The Bible says, and of some have compassion, making a difference. And our, our military makes a difference in our lives each and every day. They, they have compassion on us by sacrificing themselves. And if, there's, if um, I could have anyone who, who's serving active duty or, has been, or is a, a veteran in, in the military, any part of the service, uh, if you could just, just stand Anybody who's who served in the Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force, uh, any any part of the, the military. Um, if you could just come around and applause for their service. And thank you. You may be seated. And um, according to a, a statistic, most veterans have never actually been appreciated for their service for standing for, for their freedom even after being in the active duty. And these, um, our verse applies both to, to us and to, to the military. Uh, and of some have compassion, making a difference. They make a difference each and every day in our lives so that we can make a difference in their lives by showing them what true freedom is. And um, our, our theme is true freedom in Christ. In Ephesians chapter 1, every verse, uh, almost every verse, uses um, the word Christ or talks about Christ in that passage. And the focus is, like we just heard, heard the song, that um, through, the, through the old rugged cross, that um, Christ died on the cross for our sin. But it didn't stop there. He rose again, and, and that is why we are saved. It, and that, that, is, that is so great. And that um, at the age of five, um, I, I asked Jesus in my heart and um, didn't really know what to, to do as a child, how to surf, serve God um, up to nine, ten. And then at the age of 11, I was struck by lightning. And um, my, uh, my father came in and visited me um, after, that, after a few days of of not being able to understand anything or, or have any um, memory of anything. And my father came in and I asked him one question. Where's my dad? I asked my father this. And I would point to people in the room and go, is that my dad? Is that my dad? Is that my dad? But the next day, my, my Sunday school teacher came in and asked me five verses. And I quoted them all word perfect. God's word is most important. And if God could show that to me in my life at that time, he showed to me the, the importance of, of serving him. And uh, my father was, was in the military for, for 30 years uh, in, in the Navy. And um, most of that time, I did not see my father. Um, the past five years, I've known my father more than the whole time that he than the whole time that I've been alive. Uh, in the past five years, I've, I've known my father. 
And my brother right now has been in the Air Force for 10 years. And he also is, um, right now he's going through a course called What to Do When Captured by the Enemy. And um, right now he's being sent to Afghanistan to serve, to sacrifice for our freedom. And um, through being struck by lightning, God has called me to, to serve in, uh, in the capacity of, of military, serve missionary to our military because they sacrifice for our freedom each and every day. But many of them need to know true freedom in Christ. They need to know who God is. And um, in um, a message that I've been, been speaking um, in, the, in the past is uh, regarding Jonah in, in, the, in chapter 3 of Jonah. In, in verse 4, the Bible says, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And a hundred years later, um, from, when he, from when he said that, in the book of Nahum, the Bible tells us that Nineveh, because they returned to their wickedness, they were destroyed. And today in our lives, in America, we know who God is. We've learned, just like Jonah, Jonah proclaimed to Nineveh, and they turned to God. Are we in that hundred years? Are we in that time frame, or are we at the point where, where God is going to deal with us, where God has shown us, are we really trusting him for what, who he is and calling sin, sin, and calling God, the one true God, for who, for who he is, are we depending on him? So in, in our lives, are we having true freedom in Christ? Are we trusting what God has for us? And thank you for your time, Pastor, and I appreciate um, allowing a few minutes to speak. Thank you. God bless you. All right. We appreciate that. Amen. Amen. Somebody with a call on their life, as we spoke about this morning, God uh, calls people to preach the gospel and to tell the truth. Uh, one of the boys, come up here and get the notes here. Uh, DJ, come up here and get these. Uh, we appreciate uh, folks that listen to the call of God in their life. Uh, no one can talk me out of the call of God. James Jones said uh, in class, and I agree with him, one for your mother and one for her, yeah, for Amanda, uh, that uh, he could doubt his salvation before he'd doubt his call. And that's pretty strong, ain't it? And so uh, my, call, my call to preach the gospel, God gave that to me. No man can take it away. And it's not, I taught in Sunday school this morning, David, learned some lessons from God, and one of those lessons is that God doesn't always pick the biggest, strongest uh, person that you see. He picks people out of obscurity. He'll find someone that's over raising sheep and choose him to be a king. And so God, uh, he knows who he's choosing. And so we need to listen to the man of God when he preaches because it's someone God chose to do so. And so we appreciate that. Amen. Appreciate this. Uh, call on this young man's life. We pray God to bless them and help them uh, there in the military. Uh, Brother Gary and Brother Bill and Brother Don and Brother Donnie. I don't know who all stood up. Uh, this brother over here. You understand the military life. I lived on a military base for a little while. Uh, the military life is rough. I mean, those men are, are rough uh, and their, their life is rough. God's not much known about in the military. Um, if it is, it's because some one man or this man knows God and tries to reach him. But uh, it's a joke uh, to say someone's a chaplain in the missionary in the military. Uh, chaplains are just anybody's dog with a hunt with them, amen? And so uh, they'll just get anything and everything, and they need to hear the truth. And so we need to pray for this young man that God will use him to tell that truth. Anybody like to stand tonight and just praise the Lord for what? You know what? We ought to praise him for what he's been doing at New Hope Baptist Church. Amen. Anybody want to just do that tonight? Just praise him, praise him for his wonderful work. Yes, he is. Amen. Amen. Somebody else just want to praise him.
Amen. Statistics have changed, brother, and it's 14. If you don't reach them by 14, there's, a, there's it's 84% chance you're not going to reach them. And the world grabs a hold of them, and that ought to scare us to death. We've got, we've got some that's older than 14 that's here. Thank God a lot of those are already reached. But God is trying to save young people, and he's reviving the church in doing so. And so I'm thankful for that. Anybody else want to just praise the Lord? All right, turn your Bibles, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. I want to bring a message that uh, I feel like is needed for this hour. I feel like the Lord wants me to preach this, spoke to me very clearly about this, and I believe it will help us tonight. Let's all stand while we read God's Word. Let's actually start in uh, verse number 12. The Bible says, In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by faith of him. Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulation for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Boy that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, or exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we pray, God, that you would speak to our hearts tonight. Give us unction to preach, and I pray, God, that you'd speak to another heart tonight, and I pray that you'd show them the dire need to be saved tonight. I pray, God, that you would show them the direct path to the altar, and I pray, God, that you'd show them that you love them, and you'll save them. You're, you're committed to your word, and I pray, God, that they will uh, receive that, yield themselves to you, and be saved tonight. I pray that you would help us in our country. I pray that you would help this country to return and come back to our uh, original intent. And God, that we would be a, a Christian nation once again. I pray that you would just overwhelmingly move in these days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to bring a message out of verse number 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to bring a message on what causes us to pray. What causes us to pray? Paul was trying to divert the church, the church's attention away from his tribulation. You know, if I were going through tribulation, you'd be concerned about me. And so he was trying to divert the church's attention away from him. Someone that's humbly serving the Lord won't want all the attention on them. And he said, I'd rather that you focus on the inner man and the spiritual side of things and realize that everything that happens to us physically, God knows about. And out of, the, out of His riches, He'll bless you spiritually no matter what's going on in this world. And he said, I, for this cause I bow my knees. This is the reason that I bow my knees for you and I pray for you. And I'm asking you not to pay attention to the physical, but pay attention to the spiritual. Now, I'm going to add something here. I, we've had uh, 10, 11 folks saved here lately, uh, including the jail. We've had 11 folks saved. Now, the devil would like to divert our attention and put it on the physical. As much of that as he possibly can, 
Brother Dan stood a couple weeks ago and said, we better be careful. And that's why the Bible says be sober, be vigilant. We have an adversary and he's the devil. He'd like to jump in the middle of this revival and stop it altogether. And you say, oh, he can't do that. Oh, yes, he can through us. He can. The Bible says greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. It doesn't have to happen. We can continue down this course and see folks saved if we'll keep our eyes off of what, what uh, the devil wants us to put it on and we'll keep our hearts focused on real revival and what God wants us to do and drawing nigh to him. He said if he, he would draw nigh to him, he'll draw nigh to us. And certainly he has done that. And we talked, I don't remember what month it was, but a couple of months ago, uh, we were, it was dry as a bone. I, I mean, desert time was here. We hadn't had anybody saved in a while. And I'm just going to tell you from my heart, thank God we found the river. Amen. And uh, I'm glad that we come out of that. But we focused on something. We said we're going to start praying for these young people. And we're going to start praying for, folk, for folks to be saved. And God saved 10 and 11 of them since that time. Two adults in that, but the rest of them has been children. And God has been doing that. And he said if we draw nigh to him, he'll draw nigh to us. And he certainly has done that. I want you to understand a couple of things, and then we'll get into the meat of what I want to talk about, what causes us to pray. You need to understand that there is conditions to prayer. Amen? Listen to this. James chapter 5, verse 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. All right. There's conditions to prayer. The first condition is that we need to be in fellowship with the Lord. Now, you can be out of fellowship with the Lord. Now, how you do that is you let sin come into your life, you don't uh, confess that sin and get it straightened out with God, then it begins to separate you from fellowship. It doesn't separate you from being saved. I do not believe a saved person can ever be separated from Christ ultimately. We can be separated by fellowship. We no longer are on speaking terms. And uh, you can't pray and God's not listening and God's not hearing your prayer. And the only prayer He's going to hear from you is, uh, I confess my sin, I'm guilty. And then the Bible says he'll be faithful and just to forgive. Does that do anything for you? Amen. That God has made us a promise that even though we're wrong as rain, we can come to him and he'll, he'll draw nigh to us. And so uh, he's made us that promise. Okay? So there must be fellowship. Uh, John 15, 7 says, If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, Ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. What a great promise from the Lord. Then secondly, the second condition is, we must be obedient to the Lord. 1 John chapter 3, verse 20 through 22. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and do the things that are pleasing in His sight. Amen? Obedience, the Bible says, is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Now listen to this. A man cannot pray that things will come to pass and break God's law at the same time. We cannot pray in our heart, Brother Don, for things to come to pass that we're praying to him about and our heart have sin in it. David said, he will not hear me if I regard iniquity in my heart. And so we must be obedient to him. Amen? Amen. I, I look at these parents around here and uh, these parents around here that have young children, if they say for their children to do something and they don't, it causes their brow to wrinkle. Causes some other things too, but it really causes their brow to wrinkle. And that's disfavor, okay? Does, you don't say, Gracie, you're no longer my child, or you don't do that, but you have disfavor. There's disfavor there because of disobedience. And so for us to have favor with God, we must be, dis, we must be obedient. Then we must be submissive. Amen? 
1 John 5, 14, And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. We must submit ourselves to Him, saying, Lord, You are the Master of all, and Your will is better than my will. And be submissive to Him. Amen? The fourth thing is, uh, we need to move in the right direction. James 4, 3 says, You ask and receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your own lusts. And so we cannot move in our direction expecting God to do our, at, be at our beckoning will, but we're to be at His beckoning will, and we're not to pray for things amiss. Amen? God's not going to give us new cars and all that stuff on our own lusts. Amen? He's going to give us what we need to serve Him the best. Sometimes for me to stay poor and beggarly is the best. We was talking this morning. Uh, uh, it was, uh, uh, oh, who's the fella that uh, has the real country? Uh, uh, you like him. You know who I'm talking about. Um, the preacher. Preached on the radio. Can't, J. Vernon McGee. J. Vernon McGee said, The Lord must not trust me very much because He's never given me no money. Amen? And so uh, we don't have money. It's because, uh, you know, we don't need money. That's not what we need. I will say this, though. Listen to me. Sometimes God puts people in your church with money so that the church can do what they need to do. But He don't always put it in our pocket. Preacher Wall says it this way. God will send more through you than He will to you. And we ought to want to be funnel Christians, amen? And, uh, and, and want what God wants. So we need to be uh, in God's will. We need to be praying aright and not amiss, amen? The fifth thing is we need to be asking in Jesus' name. I've heard people pray in Baptist churches and never say in Jesus' name. Amen? Your prayer didn't get through if you didn't pray in Jesus' name. Uh, one man said this, all checks must be signed by Jesus to reach heaven. Amen? And if it's not asked in Jesus' name, then you're not praying. John 14, 13 says, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So we must ask it in Jesus' name. When we pray, to, to, when we pray we're praying to God through the Son. Amen. And so we need to ask in Jesus' name. The sixth thing is we need to do it by faith, believing that God not only can do it, but will do it. Amen? But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a, a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Amen? Prayer must be made in faith. We must believe that, that we have a God in heaven who hears our prayers and knows what we're asking. The seventh thing is, the seventh condition is, we need to pray in the Spirit. Jude, verse number 20, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Now listen, we don't have to pray for the Holy Ghost to move in on us. He's already in us. Amen. And, and if we want to pray right, we'll pray uh, in the name of Jesus and we'll pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's the way we need to pray. So there's conditions to prayer. Now, now that we know we can pray and we know that there's conditions to be met, the Bible says the, uh, the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The effectual prayer of a righteous man. And so we need to pray. Now, what causes us to pray? What is the cause of our prayer? What should be the cause of our prayer? First thing I want to talk about is conviction. Conviction ought to cause you to pray. Conviction calls me to pray and ask the Lord to save me. Amen? Conviction. The Bible says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I, I believe someone said one time, the church wants a, wants a, a salvation without a cross. They, they, want, they don't want us to step on any toes. They don't want us... And listen, I'm going to tell you something. I... I don't want, I'm, I'm in the boat with you. I, I, the Lord has to deal with me just like He has to deal with you. But He's called me to preach. He hasn't called me to coddle. He hasn't called me to pass out 
uh, pacifiers. He hasn't called me to do that. He's called me to preach the straight truth. Amen. And the straight truth will cause con con conviction in your heart. And I'm going to tell you something else. It'll cause conviction in your children's heart. And that's what we ought to want. And that's what we ought to pray for. It's God convict a soul this morning. Sit, convict a soul tonight and show them that they're lost and they need Jesus Christ. We've got folks sitting in this church right now that's lost as a ball in high weeds and they're not convicted over it. They're not convinced in their heart that they'll go to hell if they die. Now we need to be praying that God would convict of sin. Amen. And He'd show folks that they're sinners. But you know instead the churches are getting upset when preachers stand boldly and preach on the truth and tell the truth. Oh, we need to dummy it down so that we'll have more. You know what? Ten people getting saved ought to cause us to have more. Don't you think? Amen. Amen. Now those ten didn't get saved because of me and they didn't get saved because of you. They got saved because God had free course in the service to convict their hearts and show them that they were lost and they came and got saved. Amen. Amen. And so we ought to want a church where conviction has free course. Folks can get convicted and uh, sorrowful for their sin. Are you sorry you ever sinned against God? I'm sorry I ever sinned against God. Every time I do wrong, I get sorry for it. Conviction sets in. And I ask the Lord to forgive me. And I confess that sin and then get right with Him. You say, what is that sin? I don't have to confess it to you. Amen. And I don't have to confess it to a, a fellow through a knot hole. I confess it to my God. And He, the Bible says, He is faithful and just to, to forgive me and, and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Now that's what I'm talking about. We need to pray and that ought to cause us to pray. It ought to cause us to pray that there's no more conviction in lost people than there are today. Every one of us could stand today and raise our hand and say, I have a loved one that's either lost or out of church. Amen. How is it they can come around to the local church occasionally and they don't weep and cry and come to the altar? How is that? Why is it that folks are, are crowding over to these churches that are running five and six hundred and, uh, and uh, they're, you know, they got big crowds and uh, somebody, we were witnessing to this lady and her uh, brother came in who was a spiritual idiot. He came in and he said this, oh, we go to church where the pastor wears short pants and biker shirts and wears his hair spiked up and he's not under any kind of uh, labels and names and stuff. I said, son, uh, I'm going to tell you something. That Bible puts us in some boundaries. And if we don't live within those boundaries, the lost is not going to get saved. And you know why they crowd over there? Because they don't want to go somewhere where conviction is there. Amen. And so, what should cause us to pray? Conviction. We need to pray for America to get under a conviction again. Amen. And have some convictions that she stands by. But America's just free willing down the highway. Whatever comes is okay. We can do whatever we want to and say whatever we want to. They've got television shows on now called The New Normal. Sodomites. People shacking up with one another. That's the new normal. No, it's not. It's just the newest sin along the way. And I'm going to tell you something. Sin is sin. I don't care what you say. And the Bible says a fool maketh a mock at sin. Amen. And we ought to be under conviction that this world is in such a dirty mess. Our children are living in a dark, dirty world. And they're going to grow up knowing dark, dirty things. And we ought to be preaching hard that conviction is there. I sat down with them young teens this morning and my Sunday school lesson, thank the Lord, was on David, a man after God's own heart. I got to talk to them about things that they need to understand and they looked me in the eye and said, you're right, you're right, you're right. Every one of them, you're right. You know what? People are afraid, Brother Don, to talk to people about things. Wrong is wrong and right is right. And that's the way we ought to talk about it. Amen? Sin. We ought, to, we ought to be praying, and it ought to cause us to pray that not only in the world, but our church has people sitting in it that are not under conviction. Amen. We ought to, what ought to cause us to pray? Love ought to cause us to pray. Paul said he loved his kin. He loved, he loved Israel, and because he loved them, he wanted to pray for them. You know what some folks saw today? They saw, they saw an opportunity to get folks families in of these children these people that uh, to watch them get baptized you know why because they love them Amen. 
You love these bus kids? You ought to love them. You ought to want them to get saved. You ought to, you ought, it ought to cause you to pray for them. And I'm going to tell you something else. It ought to cause you to pray for their families. You know what people tell me? Well, I never lived that way. Well, so what? They're living that way. Amen. And because they're living that way, you ought to thank God you never had to live that way. But just because you didn't live that way doesn't, shouldn't cause you to love them any less. That's right. Some folks say, Brother Don, I've never been in the military. Well, so what? That ought not to keep us from having a heart for the military men to be saved. Amen. They're fighting for you whether they know you or not. Some give, some give their life. Some don't have to give their life. But they, they're always in that position where they would go and do. We met a person here the other day. He said, uh, my daughter-in-law is flying missions in a fighter jet over Afghanistan. His daughter-in-law. And I said, thank you, sir. And you tell her when you see her, thank you for serving our country and, and doing what she did. And I, I say that to you all often. That flag flies in this church because we believe that there's freedom and we ought to love our people enough to pray for them. Amen. We ought to love our military enough to pray for them. We ought to have times of prayer for our military. We ought to have times of prayer for our bus kids and our junior church and our conquerors through Christ. And we ought to have times of prayer for their parents and, and we ought to love one another. We ought to love the, the lost people and want them to come in here and get saved. Amen. That ought to cause us to pray. Amen. Amen. If, we even, if we even hear a, if a, if a grain of sand flies through here off that desert we ought to get on our knees and say Lord we don't want to go back over there we want, we want this revival to go on and we want to love folks and we want to William Booth the founder of the uh, what is that thing Salvation Army that thing started right their doctrine's wrong but they started right William Booth cared about people and he gave his life uh, for people and he was too old to come to their the last meeting they had while he was alive. And they sent him a telegraph and said, What can we say? What, what, can, and what can we tell these people that you say to them? And the message just simply came back, Others. Others. Do we care about others? Do we, do we pray that God would set love in us for others? Amen. Others. And so what ought to cause us to pray? Love ought to cause us to pray. Because we love the lost. What else ought to cause us to pray? Thirst. I want more. Do you ever pray that? Do you ever, you ever get in this precious book and every now and then just kiss it and say, Lord, I want more. Wherever you feel like you can give me, I want more. Of, I'm going to tell you, I've had times, Brother Gary, I sit in my study and just me by myself, I get up real early in the morning. And God, it just seems like he reaches down into that well, draws me out a big pail, and says, here, you thirsty, I'll give you a drink. And but it just floods my soul over, gives me something. Oh, I tell you what, God is good, is he not? Amen. And that ought to cause us to pray, Lord, I'm thirsty. Would you give me a drink tonight? Would you fill up the pasture with buckets of water and just let him come in and, and dump it about the room and we'll come and drink? Would you, would you fill me up in my study time and, and let me dip out of that well once again? That ought to cause us to pray, Lord, I want more. Give me more. Give me more of your word. Give me more of your presence. I want to feel your presence in my room. I want to feel your presence at the church house. I want to, I want to, I want to weep again. I want to cry again. I want to shout again. Amen. You ever wonder why some pout while others shout? They ain't been to the well, have they? And so we ought to, we ought to ask God to let us be thirsty. Amen? Amen? Let me give you this last thing. We ought to pray for the revival in the church. The revival personally and then the revival in the church. He promised us that if we draw nigh to Him, He'd draw nigh to us. Amen? Amen. Do you want the revival to continue? i tell you what I've been praying for. I've just been talking to God about it. But I've been praying that this thing would go over into each of us enough that we could envision lost people coming in here from all over and getting saved. The mourner's bench would be full again and people would be weeping. Amen. And that, 
the people of God weeping would cause the lost to weep. Amen. And that this revival would continue on and on and on. Folks' hearts would be right. They'd have a desire to be godly people and live after their Lord. Let me ask you a question. I never do this. What causes you to pray? That's my list. What's your list? What causes you to pray? Here's what I'm going to do. If instantly the Lord places something on your heart that causes you to pray, come and do it. Come and do it. Come and pray. What causes you to pray? What are the things in your life that causes you to pray? What if they were to call you on the phone and say, we just ran the test and your son has cancer? Would that cause you to pray? What if they were to call you on the phone and they said, uh, your wife was in an accident and she's just hanging on by a thread? Would that cause you to pray? You see, there are spiritual things that are even more important than that. It ought to cause us to pray. We've got members of this church that are not coming. That ought to cause us to pray. Who would come and pray? Who would say, I, Lord's placed it on my heart. There is a cause. And I want to come and pray for that. Whatever it is. I'm going to ask everybody to stand. You come and slip up here and pray. Ask